Thank you all. And thank you, Yaroslav. We appreciate all of you who are here this day. Dear friends, today we continue with our sermon series entitled The Seven Last Words of Christ. Thus far, we've explored the first and second saying of Christ. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And the second, truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise. For the next few moments this day, friends, we examine the third saying of Jesus. He said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. Our theme for this morning's message, comfort from the cross. Comfort from the cross. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we move forward into this time of impartation where you can impart to us, plant within us, equip and encourage us with your word. We open ourselves to you fully, mind, heart, body, and soul, that you might sculpt and change us into that which you envision us to be, that those who see us see your light shining brightly from within and are drawn to relationship with you. I now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, Every revelation that is given gives glory to you. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. Woman, here is your son. Then he said to his disciple, here is your mother. As we've learned thus far in our Thursday book study, each of the gospel writers offers us a different vision of the cross and crucifixion. While each of the synoptic simply means same Gospels, and that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, has Jesus lifted for his humanity and his compassion and his teaching, John, however, focuses on Jesus' divinity as the Son of God. John's Gospel begins in that powerfully profound way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and without him. Not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of all people. John begins his, his dissertation, this gospel of Jesus by helping us understand that Jesus was in the beginning. That there isn't this separation of God and Christ, that there is this entanglement, this interweaving together of these two. Absent from John's opening recount is the genealogy of Jesus that we find in Matthew. Oh, absent from his is the fractalization of some nation of his teaching ministry that we find in Luke. Absent from John's gospel is the matter of factness, the simplicity of describing Jesus' ministry that we find in Mark. No, for John, John is clear. I'm holding on and lifting up the divinity of who Jesus is as the Son of God, the Messiah. For John, front and center is Jesus Christ, fully divine, fully in control, fully a part of the creation of the world. So therefore, John's account of the crucifixion finds Jesus full, not of misery, not of woe, not of lament, but full of power and authority. Absent from John's gospel is conversation between Jesus and thieves. Absence from John's gospel is this cry of dereliction or this abandonment. For indeed, for John, Christ is in full control even while on the cross. So how fitting it is that in John's gospel we find this moment of comfort and compassion, this moment of reconciliation and healing. We find this poignant moment between what we think is a mother and son, but we find it as a savior and those to be saved. He says to his mother, here is your son. Then he says to his disciple, here is your mother. Jesus is offering his mother more than simply provision and cultural covering, as in that day a woman who was without husband and without son was left to fend for herself. So yes, he's providing covering for her with this disciple, but it's more than that. And he's providing for this disciple more than this humble privilege of caring for his mother. What Jesus is offering to both of them is what we understand as grief counseling. 
He's offering them compassion and care and comfort while hanging on the cross. He offers them this opportunity for catharsis, this opportunity to grieve with one another, this opportunity not to be alone in their sorrow and in their seasons of grief. Jesus is in full control of the situation, takes a moment to bid two grieving souls together that they might navigate life without him, that it might not paralyze them with grief and loneliness. In offering this gift of comfort from the cross, John highlights Jesus' ability to meet us in our valleys of darkness and despair. Jesus, fully divine, is moved with compassion to offer us grace for those moments where we need comfort for the adversities of our life, when we find ourselves asking, why, Lord, why me? Why am I having to go through this? We find a Christ who looks with us from com with compassion, even at the cross. The Reverend Dr. Vincent McMillan, in his study of African-American widows, discovered that the women who were able to successfully adjust to their new lives without their spouses had a strong aftercare support network. Dr. McMillan notes that aftercare, both professional and lay, was an essential component in the widows navigating the grief in healthy ways. Indeed, friends, we need people to journey with us when the house seems big and quiet. We need people to journey with us when tears well up and sadness seems to grip us. We need people with us to laugh with us, to cry with us, to allow us to be angry and to simply just be silent and allow us to find space for healing. Jesus, in offering this great gift of comfort from the cross, reminds us of his ability to heal, his ability to comfort, his ability to offer us compassion in our lowest of moments. Indeed, Jesus offers his mother and his best friend this grace of comfort that they needed. Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. If you've ever had that experience of being a part of someone's extended family, you understand the grace and compassion and the care that is offered when someone who is not your biological child teaches and treats you as if you were their very own and vice versa. There are many of us, I got at least four different mom, four, one, two, three, four different mamas, all of which who claim me as their son, all of which at different points of my rearing were given the authority that if he gets out of line, that's Southern tradition. If he gets out of line, you can discipline him, call me up, and then when he gets home, he going to get a double portion of whatever else he got. Four different mamas who even to this day look at me with great pride and joy and who I look at with the same love and affection that I look at my own mom because I understand that there's something about that connection and that bond of someone loving on you even though they didn't have to. And what Jesus offers his mother and what he offers his best friend is this great gift of loving on each other through the worst time in their lives. And that's what we need. We need a group of support people to help us navigate the difficult times of our life. And that's not just death, friends. Those difficult journeys come when the unexpected loss of a job happens. Those difficulties come when a relationship breaks up. Those difficulties come when someone gets sick, when we get sick. Those difficulties come in life through peaks and valleys. And we need people who are willing to journey with us, to see us at our worst, mask off questioning God and still offer us grace, compassion, and comfort. As we continue through this Lenten season, friends, let us be encouraged to be conduits of Christ's compassion, offering to others the grace God has so richly offered to us that in our moments when dark clouds gather and sorrow threatens to burden us with despair, we might remember that Christ hears our pleas and has granted us comfort from the cross.